in a 600-year-old town in a 112-year-old theater, so I had to start with a Shakespeare quote, of course. Much quoted, often misquoted, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women are merely players. Shakespeare was making a clever point about social roles and about how we all uh, tell stories in our lives. And also, while at the same time being very cynical about how we're all very, very fake, and the age he lives in is a very fake age. And it's fun that uh, even in the late 1500s, uh, people went around with that feeling. I, however, find this quote to be not inspirational or lucid, but mostly terrifying. For me personally, this is a terrifying quote. And that is because I am scared of participatory drama. I am really afraid, like some people are afraid of spiders, I am afraid that a stage magician or an improv artist or an actor when I'm in a theater will come up to me and force me to participate. This terrifies me. And this fear travels, uh, or rather maybe it's the other way around, that this is a fundamental fear that travels with me into the theater and just becomes very clear there. But, but I, any social situation where I don't understand the rules is for me personally very difficult. And most people are like me on some level in that we are scared. We get lost, we get uncomfortable, and we get confused very easily. And the core of experience design is to get people to act without any of those things happening. And that's what we're going to talk about here for the next two days. How do you get people to do things without becoming confused, lost, or uncomfortable? Now, to be able to talk about experience design, I think we should first talk about what an experience is. And to me, an experience is something that happens that changes you, so that you're different after. And these tend to be, but are not always, in some way social uh, in their nature. I'd like you to consider the case of Maisie. Maisie is seven years old. Maisie doesn't read very well. Maisie has had bad experiences with reading. When, Maisie's, when it's Maisie's turn to read in class, read aloud, the other students fidget, and sometimes they laugh. So she feels that what she has learned from reading experiences is that reading is boring and stupid, and when reading is concerned, she's the idiot. And this is a real problem, because scientifically speaking, the only way to learn how to read is to grind until you reach a level of fluency where, it's, where the content starts to be fun. But until you get there, it's just hard work. How do you design your way out of this experience? Enter the reading dog, Leshunden. Uh, these are used in many places, this Swedish name, because we also have them in Sweden and on Holland. A reading dog is an educated therapy dog with three core competencies. It likes kids, it's very patient, and it doesn't know how to read. You take the kid to a space where there is no audience, and you give the child the task to read to the dog, and the, the dog has been trained to listen. And the physical presence of this warm body will calm the human animal, so that some of the stress already is taken away from the situation. But another thing that happens is, and when the task, you, you set the task of reading, and that becomes an alibi for the reader. But what also happens is that the social roles shift, because a child who can read even very little is an expert compared to this dog. The child will read, the dog listens, and when the child sort of gets caught on a word and gets a little nervous, the dog will go and be supportive, and then the child will say, I don't know, balloon, and then the dog will go, and the reading can continue. And the child gets an experience of a success that will override the previous experience of reading being scary and sad. And you can take this experience with you out into uh, the outside world. Another way of looking at what an experience is, is through their shapes. That's probably like the only animated slide you're going to see in the next two days. <laughs> So, 
In semiotics, uh, we're taught that one of the core human metaphors is life is a journey. And this is probably true, or it is true for all kinds of reasons, but it's very pompous. Um, I, I think that in a more reasonable, a more human way of saying this is that life is a story, right? Everything in life that we need to make sense of, we turn into a story, and stories typically consist of a beginning, a middle in which something changes, and an end. And so in life, we zoom in and out of our experiences and turn them into stories wherever, wherever it's suitable for our needs at that time. But if we want to design experiences on purpose, we need to draw a line intentionally around some part of life, about some part of time and space, uh, the part where and when the experience happens. And this is sometimes called a magic circle. Um, the magic circle is magic. Uh, in two different ways. And magic here means the opposite of everyday life, right? The rules inside the magic circle are different from the rules of behavior outside the magic circle. And actions inside the magic circle have different consequences than they do in everyday life outside the magic circle. Some of you are making this face now. So I'm just going to show you some examples of magic circles that we're all pretty comfortable with. Children play, they instinctively form, or, or automatically they, they form a magic circle around them, where the thing that happens inside the game is true in the game, but it's not true in life. Uh, theater performances, uh, at least of the traditional kind where I feel safe, actors can pretend that they're somebody else, they can change their ages, they can age very fast, they can get shot and they don't die. Online games. You can be whoever you want to be within the parameters of the story, and you can engage in behaviors that are uncommon in everyday life. Carnival. Uh, some of you are from the humanities and know about how the carnival is also a metaphor for all kinds of things, says Bakhtin, but basically a carnival is a social space where we agree that everybody gets to get to go bananas for a little while. Ballroom dancing. You can touch people, even when you're in the eighth grade. And ice hockey. This, of course, is also a form of magic circle. We say, while you're on the ice, other kinds of rules apply, and actions have different consequences than they would normally. A brutal tackle is completely okay on the ice. You do the exact same thing in the parking lot, uh, you're going to get the police called on you. And this is also actually why it becomes very controversial when sometimes uh, people call the cops on violence in sports. This occasionally, it does happen that a, a tackle is so brutal that there are uh, con consequences with the law. Uh, and some people don't consider this to be fair. Now, perhaps the word magic circle conjures up something more like a ritual for you, and that is actually where the expression stems from. So, one definition of a ritual is that it's a limit around a time and space area, a magic circle, uh, within which other rules uh, apply and other behaviors, and also that it changes you. So, when you enter the magic circle, you're one thing, and when you exit it, you're something else. Something else has happened. Um, one example of this that most of us know and go to is funerals. It used to be very much about sending a person to their god. These days, I think most, many of us uh, who, who use this ritual for the grievers, so that it's a way of moving to the next stage in your grief. Uh, and it's interesting to me that the, that the religious ritual survives uh, for many people who are otherwise completely secular. They still uh, enjoy and, and get a lot of comfort from the Christian uh, or whatever, whichever faith they have from those traditions. Baptism, again, used to be about entering the child into the protection of God against demons and trolls and purgatory, but now mostly it's about giving the child a name and making it an individual member of, the, of its community. Wedding rituals obviously make you married. A doctoral defense. Has anybody been to one of these? Yeah, a couple of you have. Some of you have, I realize, gone through them as well. So this is interesting. A doctoral event is a, is a defense where you get to communicate in great detail the content of your thesis to this other lady over here, or whoever your opponent is. And if you do it successfully, they will give you your doctorate. But if this lady would 
communicate the exact same content to her in the bar the previous night or the following night, it wouldn't count. You have to do it inside the magic circle or it doesn't, it, or it doesn't perform the magic that it's meant to do. Uh, and Swedes will know of this. You enter the building a high school student, you exit the building a high school graduate, and in this country here, uh, the Swedish tradition is that the family members are not allowed inside the ma magic circle. So here we can see they've actually put up a physical boundary where the community gathers to witness this transformation. Now, we all know, or at least we have the intuitive experience, that people with power get to decide what the social rules are. Now, that's only true up to a point, but let's, let's say for the sake of argument that that's how it works. We even have one film genre where the only plot is who gets to make the rules of what behavior is okay, and that, of course, is high school movies, right? So, so this is something that humans are, I think, fundamentally very involved with. We engage with these mechanisms every day. Uh, when you are an experienced designer, however, I would argue that you are the person with the most power over that space. You are the popular girls, you're the teachers, you are society, you are tradition, you are the architects, you are in some way godlike. So, if we say that experienced design is creating frameworks for action, potential actions, limiting and enabling actions, uh, then we can say that a lot of that is boiled down to how you design the magic circle. You put a circle around the event, around the experience you're trying to create, and then you control every aspect of what happens inside that. So, you have powers, as an uh, experienced designer, these are your powers. You control the space, you make the rules, all kinds of rules, social rules, safety rules, and so on, clothes rules. Uh, and you establish what is normal inside this experience that you have designed. As Spider-Man says, though, with great power comes great responsibility, and the list of responsibilities is longer. The most important one, I think, is that you have to understand people's wishes. Of course, you can't... I mean, you still operate in a culture and in a tradition, and, and your participants will come in with expectations. And if you're trying to sell an experience to people who are not willing, who don't want that experience, it's probably going to fail. So you do need to understand what people want. Alternatively, if you have a very specific goal for your project, find the audience that wants that same thing. Making participants feel safe, uh, that is also, of course, a physical safety thing, but mostly, really, it's about that they need to know why they're there, what's going to happen, and what they are expected to take care of. Communicating expectations and rules is, of course, your responsibility as uh, an organizer, especially if these are not uh, the ordinary ones. And your responsibility is providing alibis for interaction. I'm going to run through some alibis just in a little while, but I'm just going to throw in this first. This is another responsibility that you have. I mean, this is a responsibility that we all have in all situations as human beings, of course. But I also think that in this age that we live in and with the challenges that we as a species and we as a planet are are confronting right now, I think it's extra important for everybody who is on the sort of cutting edge of their respective industries to look at how can we design uh, services and how can we design enterprises and experiences and cultural experiences that are not part of the problem, that are in some, some way part of the solution, right? Don't be evil. Like, if you have complete power over people, if, humans, if human beings come to your event or your thing or your experience with their physical bodies and give you their time, the power that you have is so immense, and the experiences that you can give them are potentially so incredibly powerful, even if it's about something very trivial, like buying a shirt in a store. The way this happens uh, comes with a baggage of choices that I think we as designers should be very aware of. And of course, not being wasteful in the env environmental sense is important, but also not being wasteful with our organization's money, I think, and with our participants' money is quite important too. Yeah, let's look at some alibis.
So that's a mask. That's one of the easiest ones, and that's one of the oldest ones. A mask comes with anonymity. It also comes with a symbolic role, sometimes both at the same time, that enables you, allows you behaviors that you wouldn't otherwise have. An instruction. I, you, some of you may have seen this on the blog. I love this. It's the empty chair rule. The rule is, in some social situations, you can make a rule that is, whenever you sit down in a group, there always has to be an empty chair so that people can join you at any time. And the only, the only thing that that person needs to qualify to join you is to find another empty chair for the next person. A social dynamic. These are pictures from a club that I ran uh, in Stockholm together with uh, an actor called Kalle Josefsson. It was called TV Klubben, the TV club. And what we did was we created theme, TV show themed parties in a nightclub environment with some very spectacular results. We had our, our, our audiences were aged from about 18 years old to their 60s. And they all spoke to each other and interacted with each other. And I don't know if you've ever been to a nightclub in Stockholm, but this is bizarre. I mean, it's absolutely bizarre that strangers would even talk to each other. And, and the social dynamic was that it's not about who's the prettiest. Social status in the room becomes about effort. So these are all participants, apart from us in the, down there in the middle with our Twin Peaks outfits. So whoever goes the most all in to show their love for this show that they, that they love, they have the highest status in the room that inevitably happens. Another social dynamic that happens, of course, is common ground. If you go to a Game of Thrones party with a posse of barbarians and you meet the bleeding eye tree ladies at the same party, then you're going to have some common ground. You already all love the same shows. So you're going to have something to talk about. And that, of course, in itself becomes an alibi for interaction. We did work with other tools as well, but those are some simple examples. A physical token can be, uh, can be uh, another alibi that's a, a playing card uh, over there in the left uh, top-hand corner with an instruction on it to find two strangers and make a romantic dinner for them. This is from a case study uh, called uh, Orange Karma that we're going to hear about tomorrow afternoon. Affirmation. I think what humans want fundamentally is to be seen. So one of the most powerful things you can do at the limit of your magic circle as people enter is to have somebody standing there saying welcome, welcome, and making eye contact and seeing every participant. And already there you've established that you, you are an individual who belong in this room, right? And that's, I think that solves about 70% of all the problems that participants have in all places. This Im image is from the Finnish annual Independence Day Ball in the President's Castle, uh, where the president, this is the previous president, Tarja Halonen, shakes hands with 3,500 guests um, over a multi-hour period, but at least they all feel really welcome. This is also all broadcast on the air, and I mean, actually, this, is, this isn't great experience design on site, because once you've shaken hands with her, then you're going to have to stand around looking polite for like two and a half hours until the dancing starts. So it's, it's bad for them. But at home, all like 98% of the Finnish population is watching this on television, together in groups, talking, analyzing the dresses, like eating special foods. So the, the broadcast becomes a very good alibi for interaction for the rest of the population, but the party isn't very fun. <laughs> but they're right about the handshaking, so I just put it up there for that reason. And of course, another really good alibi can be a fictional framework uh, or some kind of narrative structure. Here are some kids at a role-playing game. I may be prejudiced, but I look at these kids and I say they don't feel super heroic in their everyday life, but man, are they heroic this day, uh, right here. So these are some examples of alibis of interaction. I'd like, super quick, to just show another one, a physical one, Mr. Peterson. This is Bjarke, some of you may have been in oops, contact with him before. This is the catch box, this is a microphone. I have an, I'm wearing another microphone, let's see what happens, yeah. So what, this is a throwable microphone, don't kick it, because you might hurt somebody. I'm going to throw this out, and you can throw it to each other, be careful of the camera. And if you feel brave and participatory, you can stop it, 
you speak into the round thing, and then you can say just your name, and what's on your business card, and what you really do, if that's different from what it says on your business card. Okay. And if you don't want to speak right now, you just pass it on. See, that's fine, that happens too. Yes. Well done, you. That's the catch box. Uh, it's not on the market yet, but you can rent one. It's a company in Finland. I think they have some crowdfunding thing happening. Uh, but since they create alibis for interaction, we and they felt that they needed to be present through that box. Uh, yeah. So, okay, we've, been, uh, we've introduced some basic concepts, and now we're going to talk about the rules of this event. Here's one. Talk to strangers. Uh, many of you have already started talking to strangers, which is really nice. We're in a theater, so that means that when I was in the backstage area, I had a little microphone thing where I could hear the sound from the foyer, and it made me very happy. Of course, this also means that if somebody hasn't talked to strangers yet, or you just arrived, you may feel like everybody knows each other and I don't know anyone. And that's just not true. Like People don't actually all know each other. Uh, so you're welcome to talk to strangers and try and be inviting if you can in different ways. Make active choices. We've designed the best program we can. That means that today we're mostly all on one track. We're all going to do the same things, not always in the same order. Tomorrow you get to choose between some breakout options. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But if you feel that you're not currently in the right place, if you made a choice and you realize, oh, I really don't want to be here, or you're here and you realize you really need a smoke, or you really need to go and write that work email, or you're just not going to be able to concentrate, make an active choice. It's fine. Like, let's just decide right now that we are here for us, and we get to do what's best for us. Like, we don't have any prestige involved in, like, you have to stay and listen politely. Maybe this bit of it is not for you, maybe, then maybe the next bit is. It's absolutely fine. Um, phones on mute, but phones online is fine. Uh, you're very welcome to tweet and use all of those, those things, those services, and check your email and whatever you need to do. Uh, but yeah, do keep them on, on mute. Switch to English uh, if you can. I know this is hard because many of you are from like the same groups of countries or some of you feel that you know Scandinavian and then everybody else should be able to as well. We have people here from all kinds of countries. Not everybody speaks Swedish, not everybody speaks Danish. Uh, so do when you can switch to English, even maybe when you're only in a Nordic group because that makes it possible for others to join you. And that's our hashtag. If you wanna, if you wanna talk to the outside world, you're very welcome to. Yeah.